Okay, hello everyone and welcome to uh, today's second session. I'm very excited. I'm very much looking forward to uh, take you on a journey uh, into the exciting world of Solanaceae pollen analysis. I'm particularly happy to talk about this uh, subject because I have been personally involved in numerous uh, so-called technology uh, implementation projects. These are projects in which we as a company, together with a customer or collaboration partner, implemented systematic pollen quality testing into a, uh, let's say, pollen management workflow. And in my talk, I would like to kind of uh, showcase uh, the most intriguing findings and learnings of all this uh, work. Maybe a few words about uh, how I got involved in uh, pollen analysis. As Sad already mentioned, I graduated in biomedical engineering, and then I worked in the development of diagnostic tests and tools, mostly in a clinical setting. And all of a sudden, I found myself standing in this huge tomato field far, far away from home. And uh, you may ask yourself, uh, how did that happen? Well, um, I started to work uh, with emphasis. On that emphasis, we want to revolutionize pollen analysis because over the course of the last couple of years, we realized how important systematic uh, pollen analysis can be, particularly in the field of Solanaceae. And besides being a technology provider, we became uh, experienced consultants in various uh, areas from breeding to seed production. And in the next, next couple of slides, I would like to uh, show you how diverse, extensive, and also complex a pollen supply chain can be, and why I believe that systematic testing has a big value. So let's have a look. When we talk about the pollen supply chain, we often refer to a process uh, like I have it depicted here. This is a schematic um, depiction of a supply chain that we could find, for instance, in um, tomato or in pepper seed production. The process starts with production of pollen. Then this pollen is collected. It is preserved. It may be transported to another location. Then it's uh, thawed and used for pollination. If you were a pollen grain traveling all along this process, you can imagine that you would be exposed to a variety of different conditions, different temperatures, different humidities, um, all of which can influence your uh, viability or your quality. Now, if you want to ensure uh, high pollen quality at the very end of the process, when you pollinate, um, that's when it matters on the stigma. Um, you need to understand your process and you have to make sure that you don't have any substantial uh, pollen quality decrease all along the way. And we propose to do this using so-called uh, pollen quality gates. Pollen quality gates are checkpoints for systematic uh, pollen quality monitoring. And those checkpoints are placed um, all along the supply chain in the most critical uh, steps. Critical steps in that sense are steps in which the pollen quality can deteriorate. And the goal of such quality gates is kind of a constant surveillance of the whole process, ensuring that everything goes fine and what you use in the end is actually uh, fulfilling certain quality requirements. We will talk about that uh, a bit later. Now, if you look at such a process, a number of questions can pop up immediately. For instance, when do we collect pollen and what do we collect? What is the optimum temperature and uh, humidity profile for pollen dehydration? How long can I actually store my pollen? Can I store it at all? And under which conditions? Which ones are the favorable uh, conditions? Can I ship pollen? What is happening in that parcel on the way? Do we really receive the same thing that we sent in the beginning? Can I expand my pollen sample with a diluent? And what pollen quality and quantity are needed in order to obtain a full uh, seed set? So all these topics can be addressed with pollen analysis methods. 
Now let's dig a little bit deeper. The first topic I would like to talk about is variation. Variation is what justifies testing. If you don't have variation, you don't really need to do a test. And I can tell you something, there is a lot of variation in uh, Solanaceae pollen quality analysis. In order to illustrate that, I collected 1,000 uh, tomato pollen measurements, collected all over the globe in different steps of this whole uh, supply chain. And I plotted here the pollen viability of these thousand measurements um, in decreasing order. What you can see is that we have um, pollen samples with viabilities as close as uh, as high as 100%. And we also have uh, very bad pollen samples with hardly any viable cell. So variation is uh, a reality in the Solanaceae uh, pollen supply chain. And importantly, in this graph, we are not necessarily moving from the early part of the supply chain when we produce and collect pollen to the late stage when we pollinate. We found this variation, these patterns throughout the entire supply chain. And I can give you two examples uh, for that. When we collected fresh pollen in the field, we had samples um, with a viability of 95% and we had samples with a viability of down to 30%. And at the last stage of the supply chain, when we measured um, pollen on the stigma, so we retrieved stigmas, we extracted the pollen, we measured it, uh, we again found viabilities as high as 80% down to almost 0%. So there is a whole lot of variation throughout this entire supply chain. And that's why I believe testing is um, crucial. What can we learn from variation? When you have variation, you often have the potential for optimization. For instance, here we have um, done an interesting experiment. We uh, collected hundreds of um, flowers or stamens from a field. Uh, with different developmental stages. So those ranged from a closed bud flower, kind of a bell-shaped flower, and a nicely uh, fully open flower. And we quantified in, or we, we extracted the pollen, we processed that pollen, we had this powdery substance in the end, and we quantified what is the fraction of mature uh, viable pollen grains, because that's what we're interested in uh, after all. And it turned out that the fully open flower gave us the highest fraction of these uh, viable pollen grains. That was kind of expected. It's not so much a big deal. Um, I was a bit more puzzled about the, the fact that we had, uh, we retrieved only, let's say, 40% uh, viable pollen from that, uh, and that particular time point in that particular field, which I think is not really a lot for tomato. And I was wondering, um, are all flowers around these 40% or is there a variation, a bigger variation? So we went back to the field, we collected again uh, numerous flowers, and then we measured um, the pollen quality of individual flowers, not this um, processed pollen that comes from hundreds uh, of stamens or flowers, but individual values. And the pattern was really surprising. I didn't expect it to look like this. We had flowers or stamens with viabilities uh, up to 80% and down to almost 20%. Same line, same field, same time point. Now, understanding the sources of such a pattern can help you in optimizing your collection strategy. Because imagine you could selectively pick flowers with a very high pollen quality you could immediately increase your average uh, pollen viability from maybe a bit more than 40% to over 60%. You would have a lower uh, quantity, obviously, but the quality would be definitely higher. And this gives you um, a better starting point into your whole supply chain. Because imagine, um, as you can imagine, the, the pollen quality throughout the chain is not getting any better with every step. So it's only deteriorating. So the higher your starting material, the better will be the outcome at the very end. In the last slide, we saw that there is variation in space. So between 
um, answers or statements. Um, there's also variation in time. We uh, performed an experiment in which we collected again uh, many flowers from the field, we extracted the pollen and then uh, repeated this procedure over the course of two months. And the viability pattern uh, is displayed in this graph. So I think it goes without saying that pollen quality is indeed a very dynamic parameter. We have peak viabilities of over 80% um, and uh, very low uh, pollen qualities compared to the peak, let's say, of a little bit over uh, 40%. And again, understanding the variation or dy dynamics can give you valuable insights into process optimization. For instance, you can ask which factors are responsible for such a pattern. Is it a temperature stress? Is it radiation? Is it an irrigation problem? Is it uh, application of pesticides? And it also allows you to tackle very, uh, say, practical um, aspects, for instance, um, should we actually collect pollen on that day here? Is it really worth it um, sending out many people to manually collect those flowers, processing the pollen, storing it, uh, occupying freezer space? Is it really worth it? So all these um, sources of variation should be understood because this gives you leverage or this gives you a, a potential for, for optimization. Here we go beyond viable and dead. And uh, here I would also like to make the link to uh, Martin Janssen's uh, very nice presentation just about an hour ago. Here we dig a bit into a similar direction. When we talk about pollen viability, we often uh, refer to the fraction of mature pollen grains in a population of the total mature uh, or a fraction of viable pollen grains and total of uh, mature pollen grain. And I can uh, depict that with a typical result that uh, our uh, pollen analyzer generates. Um, some of you uh, may have heard it already. I just repeat it for the ones who haven't heard it yet. Um, typical result looks like this. We call it a scatter plot. It consists of individual points. Each point corresponds to a particle that has been measured. In our case, it will be a pollen grain that has been measured. And those points form certain clouds or clusters. Now, points that are close to each other have similar properties. Translated to our measurement, it means that cells that are um, clustering like this have similar dielectric properties. In this example, we see two distinct clouds, one here and one here. And we know that the cloud on the right-hand side corresponds to mature viable cells. The cloud on the left-hand side corresponds to mature dead cells. Now, in the past, we often came across samples that looked similar, but were still a bit different. We had patterns like this. Again, mature viable cells, mature dead cells, and all of a sudden we had an additional population here at the bottom of this graph. And we were wondering, what is this? We looked at the microscope and it turned out that in all these samples, we had a considerable fraction of such amorphous, small, um, shriveled uh, cells. We call them aberrant uh, pollen grains. Now, in the case of tomato, we found that most samples actually contain such aberrant cells, roughly 5% on average. But we also found extremes with more than 60% of those uh, cells. And this has now severe implications in your, uh, your process. Imagine that you have to start your whole supply chain with a pollen viability that is lower than 40% just because those aberrant cells occupy a fraction of uh, more than 60%. It also seems to be a line specific phenomenon. And in literature, it has been associated with uh, heat stress. And this stress condition leads to the abortion of cells in their early development. And again, I would like to make the link to the previous presentation in which uh, Martin mentioned that the most susceptible step in this whole uh, sexual reproduction process is around meiosis. So 
this is uh, very much in line with the observation uh, that we have here. I also elaborated a bit more about this topic in a blog post. So feel free to have a look on our website. You can also subscribe and get uh, updates on, on the blog post that we plan to release very soon. So there are very, three very interesting topics in the pipeline. Importantly, we have observed those aberrant cells not only in tomato, but also in other crops such as pepper and corn. So to summarize, they can significantly decrease your pollen quality and such a measurement result uh, can give you immediately uh, kind of an indication where in the whole process to look for a problem. Because as those uh, pollen grains are aborted in their own development, the at the time point of pollen collection, you have it already. So you don't need to optimize anything downstream of that. You have to look upstream uh, in the growth conditions uh, of such plants or even in your breeding program when it comes to stress tolerance of uh, certain lines. I just had a look at our uh, questions and answers uh, box and I've seen that uh, you guys have become active. I would like to encourage you to keep on asking questions right now whenever you have them and not saving them for the end of the session. Um, Georg will collect them and it will make his life a bit easier if you ask your questions already uh, during the session. So highly encouraged to keep on asking. Thank you. So, so far we uh, mostly talked about the early stages of the process when we produce and collect pollen. Let's have a look now at the other end to the pollination. That's when it actually matters. And here we were interested in uh, finding out how many pollen grains are actually on a pollinated stigma. So we let experts um, emasculate and pollinate uh, flowers and then we came and we cut off those um, pollinated stigmas and we quantified what we find uh, on those stigmas. So we found viable cells, we found dead cells, we found aberrant cells, we found diluent particles, we found debris, all kinds of things. And I plotted here the number of viable pollen grains found on individual stigmas. So all these data points are individual stigmas. What you can see is that um, the general viable pollen load on such a stigma is relatively high. Um, we had an average of several thousand, three and a half thousand viable pollen grains on a stigma. Putting that into perspective, uh, I think a Tomato fruit usually contains some 50 or 25 to 250 um, seeds. So um, we have definitely many more uh, viable pollen grains um, on a stigma than there are ovules to be fertilized. Even more uh, interesting for me from a process optimization uh, point of view is the variation again that we find here. Um, we had a 44 fold difference between maximum viable pollen load and the minimum viable pollen load. And this immediately raises two questions. Do we actually pollinate sufficiently here at the lower end? Uh, and don't we waste a lot of pollen if we have um, examples like this here? So there is a high variation in the number of pollen grains used for pollination. And uh, here I see several aspects to investigate further. For instance, can we ensure an, an operator independent uh, method that is uh, yeah, unbiased and doesn't have any methodological flaws? Can we ensure such a method or develop such a method um, which ensures that we always apply um, the same amount of viable pollen, just enough uh, and not too much? Then if you work with um, mixtures of pollen and diluent, uh, are you really sure that this mix is fully homogeneous? Because if there are micro heterogeneities in such a mixture, or even if pollen or diluent is forming clumps, you will start observing such patterns with the risk of insufficient pollination or waste of material. And then also, if you work with different pollen batches uh, from, from stock, 
with different liabilities, um, do you really adjust your pollination practice uh, according to the to the quality of a pollen batch, or do you have your standardized um, protocol and uh, don't really account for differences uh, or batch to batch variation? And this brings me to the next topic, and let's call this topic customized pollination recipes. Customized pollination recipes are, I would call them pollination instructions. They basically tell you how to pollinate um, in order to apply sufficient pollen. Um, so basically applying a certain amount of viable pollen grains that are needed in order to get the full seed set. And at the same time, not over pollinating, not overloading uh, the stigma. And the key questions in the process of um, creating such recipes are, in my opinion, can I achieve a full seed set with my pollen? Can I expand pollen with a diluent to save material? What is the female-male compatibility? And how can I make a more reliable yield forecast? Let's dig a bit deeper into that topic. If you want to come up with such a customized pollination recipe, you have to follow a certain step-by-step -step procedure. I would start off with um, standardizing my pollination routine. Um, getting rid of any operator bias, making sure my pollen batches are uh, homogeneous, nicely powdery, not clumping, uh, all these kind of aspects that we covered just before. In a second step, I would have a closer look at the female part and optimize the time point of emasculation and the time point of pollination. And in the third step, you come back to the pollen or the actual uh, pollination and you perform the following experiment. So basically you pollinate with a wide range of pollen qualities, ranging from 0% viable pollen to the best you can get basically. And what you will get is something like the following. If you don't apply any viable pollen or very little viable pollen, you will hardly get any seed, uh, any seed set. If you start applying more viable pollen, you will get more seed. So the more you apply, the more seed you get. If you apply even more pollen, you will get more seed. So in this part of the experiment, the pollen is the limiting factor of this whole system. But at some point, if you add more pollen to that stigma, more viable pollen, you will not get any more seed. So in this case, we have other factors that come into play, like the compatibility, and uh, yeah, the, the conditions in which such a cross is taking place and genetic factors, surface of the stigma, so, or the number of ovules, so these other factors take over and become dominant. And if you have such a data set, you can start extracting the maximum seed set, for instance, and you can use a mathematical model to describe it, for instance, in this case, um, a saturation model. Now, this saturation model basically allows you to tell at what po viable pollen load do I get a full seed set. For instance, if you add a lot of viable pollen on that stigma, you will get the full seed set. On the other hand, you could have added much less and you would still have reached quite a high seed set. If you, on the other hand, um, pollinate with very little pollen, little viable pollen, we are in this area and you will not get uh, the, the best outcome. So the optimum will be somewhere here in between. Now, in the title, I wrote customized pollination recipes. I wrote customized because this curve um, depends a lot on the crop you use or you're working with and the cross. So you can also have um, a later uh, time point of saturation, you can have no saturation at all. So this really depends on the system you are working with. That's an important comment. Um, if you do not only include pollen viability data, but also quantify pollen grains on the stigma, you can uh, model the whole behavior and kind of predict the seed set you can expect for a certain uh, 
viability and quantity of pollen that uh, is applied. You can create these hyperplanes. They look nice and fancy, but they're not very practical yet. So in the next step, you could create so-called um, customized pollination recipes. In such a recipe, you have on the x-axis the um, pollen viability of your pollen sample that you take from the stock. And on the y-axis, the percentage of pollen you need for the pollination. So basically, um, for 20%, uh, this basically means you can dilute your uh, pollen sample with 80% of a uh, diluent. So let's take two examples. If you have a very high pollen uh, viability, you have your process well under control, you have 80%. Um, this optimum line here will tell you that you can dilute your sample 50-50 with a diluent. If you have a supply chain problem and your pollen viability is only 20%, you're landing in this area, and this area tells you that you should mix this pollen sample with a higher uh, quality pollen to achieve 40% uh, target viability. If you don't do that, um, uh, you have to be aware that you may not get the full um, seed set. Now, coming up with such a recipe is um, quite a process. You have to put quite a bit of effort into it. And that's why I think having a standardized pollen viability test is crucial if you go in that direction. We see the value of a standardized test in many areas. For instance, if you ship pollen between collection and production sites to and from uh, subcontractors, uh, you want to know what is happening on the way, whether what this person shipped to you uh, has changed uh, over the process. Um, when you sell or buy pollen, for instance, if you're a seller, you may want to add kind of a quality label to give value to your product. Um, or if you buy pollen, uh, you may want to be sure that uh, what you pay for, that, that you also get for what you pay for. And then also, especially in research, you may want to compare viability data or pollen counting data generally um, between different sites and also over time. For us as a company, standardization of a test has been um, very important from the beginning because we know that many of our customers work in big companies with sites all over the world and um, people want to exchange results. They want to be able to compare results. We know that certain lines are grown in several countries. So if you don't have a standardized testing system, you cannot really um, do a proper line characterization. And we also know that certain experiments in that field are very long experiments. They can last for several years if we think of a proper line characterization. And uh, here again, it's very crucial to have a test that allows you to compare data acquired five years ago with data acquired today. From data to decision, here I would like to uh, show you how just a few measurements can already give you valuable insights on the supply chain um, and where to optimize. If you have a sample like this, uh, very high viability. We can say congratulations, everything under control, good job. And you may even dilute such a sample with a high quality, such a high quality pollen sample with um, a diluent to uh, save this precious material and eventually even uh, reduce the surface used for pollen production. If you have an intermediate viability like this one, it's definitely not bad, but depending on the behavior of your crop or cross, it may not be sufficient to get um, the best seed set. And here you could look at pollen collection, storage, or transportation. If you have a low viability sample, like in this case here, you better have a look at um, pollen supply chain uh, because you will most likely not get a good seed set. You still don't really have to discard such a sample. Uh, you can uh, maybe still use it as a diluent uh, for high quality pollen in case you have such a pollination recipe in place.
And then you may also encounter such uh, aberrant cells. So again, this population here at the bottom of the graph, this will indicate that something in the pollen development uh, goes wrong, not really in the processing of the pollen afterwards, but further upstream in the development. And here I would recommend to have a look at stress resistance and growth conditions. So to wrap up, um, in my opinion, pollen quality matters and pollen data is valuable, it's precious. Um, the Solanacea pollen supply chain is um, a relatively complex process, as you can see here, involving many steps. And uh, I see a big value in understanding, in characterizing and optimizing such a process. Um, Amphasis technology is First of all, a standardized uh, pollen quality test, and it's also fast and reliable. And this, these properties of the test open up a wide range of applications in breeding, uh, characterization, optimization of the entire supply chain. Maybe, maybe I can pick a few examples again. You can implement these quality gates in key process steps, in process steps of which you know that the pollen quality can deteriorate. Um, you can test your pollen quality before and after shipping. Um, you can uh, optimize conditions, uh, for instance, for the uh, preservation of pollen. Uh, you can even start using pollen data for yield forecasting. If you have done all the efforts of coming up with such a pollination recipe, you can compare data with your friends uh, or colleagues all around the world. Um, you see there is a broad range of, of applications and the neat thing is, uh, in my opinion, that's, that all these topics can be covered with one single technology. And this technology is very fast, it allows you to operate at the high throughput and uh, yeah, just to give you a bit of a, a feeling, measurement usually lasts 30 seconds to a minute maybe. This is enough to measure several thousand uh, pollen grains. And now I've been talking a little bit too long, I see, but uh, uh, in, in the duration of this talk, maybe 25 to 30 minutes, uh, you could have measured already um, one and a half million pollen grains on the single cell level. And for me, this is quite impressive. And with this, I would like to close uh, my talk and thank you very much for joining, for your attention and I'm very much looking forward to some uh, interesting discussions and questions and uh, yeah, hand over to my colleague Georg. Silvan, thank you very much for the great presentation. A lot of questions were coming in from the participants. You were starting with the supply chain and there were some questions regarding where in the supply chain do you see the biggest potential for some optimization? Because you showed that you're losing basically pollen viability normally and how we can optimize this. Um, a very general question, a very good question. Um, the depiction of the supply chain kind of indicates that the process steps are always a bit similar, which is true, but definitely there are, we have found subtle differences um, working with different customers. So I cannot really give a general answer to this, but what we have found repeatedly is that um, the pollen dehydration step is a very crucial step or a very critical step, maybe the better word. Um, here we have found a lot of um, pollen viability deterioration in that particular step. And maybe to continue a bit on that thought, um, a lot of effort was always uh, put into optimizing this dehydration step to reach a certain moisture content, having a, a nice and gentle temperature profile, all these kind of things. Um, but I think very few people also pay attention to, to the thawing process. At the end, if you take a pollen stock out of the fridge, are we really paying enough or doing enough efforts to really understand also this process? Do we really uh, have kind of a gentle procedure in place also there? Because this I think is also quite critical. I don't have a lot of experience with this, but I think it's worthwhile having a look into this aspect also.
and generally just like with many processes it's garbage in garbage out principle the, the better your pollen quality in the beginning of the process the better it will be at the end of the process pollen quality will only deteriorate with every single step down the road so this is definitely also an aspect i would uh, consider one more question regarding the supply chain came uh, in if you want to optimize the supply chain where do you want to start or where would you start goes a bit in the same direction as i said there is there's also variation in supply mm. chains and i think the best thing to do is take your instrument on a journey start with fresh pollen in the field collect the pollen uh, process the pollen dehydrate it store it thaw it transport it pollinate do this whole journey also include the very last point that uh, quantification of the pollen liability on the stigma because this is really when it matters so if you take out your pollen sample from the stock and this is the last measurement time point you don't really know what is happening on the way to the field and what is actually landing on the on the stigma so i think doing this whole journey it's not a lot of effort and i think it really it can give you a really nice curve in the end uh, of the pollen quality uh, over each process steps and it allows you to identify the the drops so the most critical steps that can be optimized well and you already mentioned the stigma there are a lot of questions and they were the participants defense were curious about how can i measure the the tomato pollen on the stigma? Um, it's actually very simple. It's actually very simple and I think almost nobody does it. And uh, I like the experiment. It's, uh, it's straightforward. Uh, you let somebody pollinate who knows his job, who is doing this, who has a certain routine. Um, you let this person emasculate and pollinate. So just regular routine practice. And then you go there and you collect those uh, stigmas in the field directly right after pollination so the collection and measurement should take place right after pollination you don't want uh, pollen tubes to grow down the style already because uh, in the end we need to retrieve those particles from the stigmatic surface so what we recommend is going to the field cutting those uh, stigmas putting one stigma in one eppendorf tube uh, you go back to your instrument, you add a bit of buffer to your sample, you shake it to get uh, to kind of release all the particles from the stigmatic surface, and then you uh, do your measurement with the counting mode. That's uh, maybe another important hint. Um, you have a certain uh, measurement mode that uh, allows you to, to measure a particular uh, volume of sample and give you a very uh, accurate uh, indication of um cell concentration for instance or a total cell count in in a sample and counting mode templates by the way can be downloaded uh, on the website so i think again pointing out um don't waste any time from the collection of those stigmas to the measurement because you don't want the, the pollen tubes to to grow there are one more questions can the samples be prepared in batches maybe i can also elaborate on that so basically it depends on the species that you are measuring for tomato for example it's very stable so basically that's possible to prepare it into batches um, with other species like i will start afterwards with uh, wheat it's not that easy um yeah do you have something to add sylvan to that question no just that it really depends on the stability of your pollen. Stability of, of the pollen in general, how fast does a pollen deteriorate? In uh, tomato and pepper, we are very lucky. This pollen is uh, extremely stable. So leaving it for a few minutes or even hours doesn't really change so much. In a uh, georg session right afterwards, uh, you will see a whole different scenario. And I see Sarah is already joining back into the session. Thank you very much, Silvan and Georg, for your presentation and dealing with the questions. Um, as always, when I come in, that means um, interruption. I'm um, very sorry that I have to interrupt you at this point. There are still many um, unanswered questions and questions are still coming in. 
Um, unfortunately, we do have to um, slowly close this session here as we will start our next one um, at four o'clock. So in about um, 20 minutes and we need to prepare and change the rooms for that. Um, all of you who would like to go into more details, whose questions were not yet um, answered or addressed, please, um, we kindly invite you to contact us. We're happy to go into the details. Um, you can write us an email at info at amphosis.com or you'll find Sylvan's details um, on the website on the respective um, registration page of his session if you would like to contact him directly. We are happy to receive your questions. Um, thank you to our audience for being here with us. I hope you um, got a lot of benefit out of this session. I kindly invite you to join us for the next one. Georg will talk about wheat pollen analysis um, in a few minutes. So there's time to go for a short bio break and get a coffee before we start. Um, the session was recorded and I will happily share a link with you within the next few days where you can watch everything again. So thank you very much and um, I hope to see you soon and have a nice day. Bye.